Thank you, Felicia. Welcome everyone to King Trumpet Mushroom Study and Gouache Part 2. I'm your instructor, Adrian Hodge, and I'm joining you from my home studio desk here in Austin, Texas. And uh, this is a continuation of a class we had two weeks ago. Um, so if you missed part one, you can find it on uh, YouTube and Felicia can drop that uh, link in the chat or you can search uh, King Trumpet Mushroom Study in Gouache part one if you're watching this recording later on YouTube and wanting to find part one. Uh, but if you're watching live and you missed part one, stick around because you can definitely you know, pick up something, maybe jump in with us here uh, tonight real quick or, um, you know, go back and, and fill in the gaps later. So uh, I just want to talk about some classes that we have coming up with Michael's in the next couple of weeks since we had a week break since uh, we last had a class. So in the next couple of weeks, I've got these really two fun classes and some more gouache stuff coming up. So if you're enjoying gouache painting, uh, we've first we've got this class called the, the Painter's Sketchbook um, using uh, value studies and light. I can't remember the exact title. I probably should have written it down, uh, but you can sign up for that one where you signed up for uh, tonight's class. And then after that, we're gonna build on that and do the same little landscape study focusing on uh, black and white and then inverted light. So the same image, we're gonna sketch it next week. And then the following week, we will be painting this little study in a watercolor sketchbook using acrylic gouache. So a little bit different gouache than what I'm using tonight, but you maybe do have the acrylic gouache for tonight. So uh, make sure you check out those classes that are coming up for the rest of April. And then I'm gonna switch to my tabletop view and go over supplies and we'll get started here. So don't forget to tag your work with those hashtags, make it with Michael's or Michael's classes. And you can follow me on Instagram at Adrian Hodge Art. Um, I also just post about it, posted about a couple of independent classes that I've got Coming up, uh, one is a three hour workshop on drawing and painting clouds on Zoom. And another one is uh, my online weekly draw club that I've been doing on Saturday mornings. So we've got a fun uh, session of that planned this Saturday. If you enjoy my teaching style and want to do some other stuff with me outside of Michael's, you can check out other stuff I have going on at Adrian Hodge Art on Instagram or on Facebook. So I'm Adrian Hodge Fine Art on Facebook, and here's some of my business cards. I'm always flashing on the screen real quick to show you about other things I have going on. Okay, and yeah, so this is what our finished product may look like by uh, the end of the evening. Results may vary depending on where you are in your, your painting practice and uh, skill level. This was where we left off last week. So we got the mushrooms sketched out and we got just a first layer of wash of gouache down. Wash and gouache is really hard to say in the same sentence. Okay, so supplies. Uh, we are. I'm using this Artist Loft jelly gouache that the lovely folks at Michael's sent me a while back to try out. And you can find it on in the supply list and then you I suggested a few other types of gouache that you might use so you might not have the exact same gouache and that's totally fine and then we've got paint brushes you might not have the exact same paint brushes but if you've got a round brush a liner brush and a flat brush that should get you through the the class nicely and the exact paint brushes that I suggested are listed in the supply list and then we're gonna want some tape to tape down the, the margins here and maybe you still have yours taped down. I took mine off of my mat, so I'm gonna retape it here and I'll just demonstrate that in a moment for anybody who also needs to retape theirs down. And then maybe an eraser nearby to erase your pencil lines if you can still see those through the paint, although the gouache should cover up any pencil lines. 
but just in case you might have that. And then water cups, I like to have two water cups, one for my lighter colors and one for my darker colors so that I don't have to get up and uh, rinse out my water cups too often if they get too muddy, or it's just nice to have a backup if you're using the same one and it gets muddy really fast. And then some paper towels. I've got some shop towels here. And I think that's it. I felt like there was more last week because we were sketching. Uh, but I am going to go ahead and just show you where we kind of review everything we did in part one for anybody who's just jumping in. So uh, we did a little thumbnail sketch just to basically organize the king trumpet mushrooms all on the same uh, rectangle, get them all squished in there because sometimes you start sketching when you've got a series of items like this, the proportions might be a little off. And so sketching it ahead of time, just to notice the spacing between each one. And we talked about how uh, we've basically got a cylinder here from a few different angles. So we talked about the vertical and horizontal contour lines that you might find on a cylinder and how that would translate to the contour lines on these mushrooms. And then I did a little zoom in here and I pointed out how my eye level is right in the middle of the mushrooms. So those horizontal axis contour lines might curve up above that eye line and then curve down below the eye line. So we discussed the, the contour lines in that way. But then I said, you know, don't get too bogged down by the contour lines if that's uh, confusing in part one, and then we sketched it all again on the watercolor paper. So there was definitely a good step-by-step -step to follow through, follow along with to, to get you to, to where we landed at the end of part one with our sketch. So we sketched it all in in pencil. Then we started with the background and created a wash in our background. We started with painting with water first in the background and then dropped in whatever color, and I encouraged people to use different colors than me for the background, although it's totally fine if you wanna do that pink purple, like I did in my example too, but I thought it would be fun if we had some different colored backgrounds. So they were all, we had a variety at the end here. And while we were waiting for that first layer to dry on the background, because that is very essential, in the painting process with any water media that you let each layer dry before you move on to the next layer, primarily because if we had started painting the mushrooms with this super wet background, it would have bled into the background. So we had to wait for that background to dry. And we are gonna put another layer down on the background here in just a moment before we move on to uh, filling in our next layers on the King Trumpet mushrooms as well. Um, so while we were waiting for that to dry, we talked about our color palette for the mushrooms themselves. And just realized I forgot to mention our reference images, which were included with the supply list. But in the reference images, I have uh, a couple of different filters that I put on this photograph just because I felt like it wasn't stylish enough when I was planning for the class. So I, I liked how this filter made them feel a little vintage. I really liked the warmer colors on uh, the mushrooms whenever I put this filter on and I also put a little vignette on uh, to try to blur out my cutting board there. This was the un, um, unedited photo and then I also pulled the mushrooms themselves out of the image completely so that we could focus on them without the distraction of the background but we definitely needed the background there to sketch in those shadows. So um, anyway, we used all of these reference photos and we'll continue to use all of them tonight just because all of them may be helpful in different ways, but I'm mainly following the colors that I'm seeing in this one with the filter. So I went a little warmer with my hues here. So I got this kind of reddish brown and these ochre colors and a gray. So these three or four colors here, because these are pretty similar. Um, this is basically just a darker version of that. Uh, and this is uh, basically these two colors mixed together, the gray and the okra to get this sort of grayish okra to happen. 
so yeah, those are the main colors that, that we're going to continue working with tonight. So we can work on remixing those after we uh, do our second layer on the background. So first thing I'm going to do, well, before I move on, are there any questions about supplies? I'm not seeing anything so far. Just a lot of lovely greetings in the chat. Um, nice to see so many familiar faces. Okay, so I'm just going to take my tape. I'll zoom out a little bit here so that you can see more of the taping process. Move some things out of the way for myself. Okay, so I'm basically just going to go right across on the margins that I already have there and just get it to be flush against the table. I left some pretty big margins on this paper because I'm using a bigger sheet of paper than I did for the the classic other class example, and I wanted it to be able to fit on the Zoom screen here. So it's always a little tricky re-taping something down and trying to get it flush against the table. So you might have bubbles, like I already have a bubble there, but I'm just gonna do my best to get it as flush as possible. On all four sides. I have to use some extra tape to encourage it. And I want to try to get as close to that line as possible so I don't have a weird double layer showing there. Trying to encourage this paper to lay flat. And I'm remembering one thing I could have done to flatten this paper out that I just did not even think about until this moment. But um, if you're patient and this is an issue that you're having, you could pause this. And if you're watching later on YouTube, uh, you can spritz the back of a piece of paper that's buckled like this watercolor paper and then lay it flat underneath a stack of books and it should flatten back out nicely. So if it's not showing up how much it's bubbling on the zoom, but I do have a pretty big bubble there at the top. So when I'm done, I might want to spritz it and do that. Oh my goodness, I just realized my cord is draped. I had the chat in front of the, the screen there. So I wasn't noticing that. Uh, okay, so let me get some of this other stuff out of the way here. Too many things on my desk. And we'll get this same color for the background that we started with before. One of the beautiful things about gouache is that it can be reactivated. Uh, so if you still have your colors from two weeks ago on your palette, all you have to do is, if you have enough of them, you could spritz them with water and bring them back to life. But if it's just a thin layer of color, then that might be trickier to do. So I've got my little spritz bottle here, mostly because I'm using this, this jelly gouache that I mentioned that sometimes could use a little spritzing just to come back to life in the container here. I'm just going to spritz that. And I was using this magenta color pretty straight out of the, the cake like it comes. I didn't do much to it other than water it down for the wash last week. And 
I think I'm just going to stick to pink, y'all, instead of adding the purple. But what I did last time was I mixed in a little bit of purple with it. And I probably did two, I mean, I probably did three layers on the background because I recall doing uh, a layer in, um, in pink and then a second layer in pink and then deciding I wanted to bring purple into it. So then I mixed some purple in. So that's why it kind of is a little streaky and purple in some places and pink in others. Let's see, maybe I could do that again. I'm like, how much time will that take up? Sometimes I do things when I'm prepping for classes and I don't think about how much extra time that adds to the class because that was kind of three layers and we could really just get by with a second layer on this background. But let me try it and see how it turns out. It's okay if it's streaky. One thing about gouache that a lot of people get uh, frustrated with that like in my in-person classes here in Austin, I teach uh, gouache painting in person and people make a lot of comments about they don't like the visible brush strokes that happen with gouache and they wanna know how to get rid of them. And I always say, you've got to embrace those, those visible brush strokes because that is sort of the beauty of gouache. But I'm taking this magenta color out and just putting it in my palette. Let's spritz it a little bit more here. And I'm just getting it to be thicker than it was before but still pretty fluid so not as watery and washy as we had it uh, in part one when we were doing that first layer but I'm going to add a little water here. I'm just getting it to be nice and fluid and I want a big pile of it so sometimes when you don't prepare enough of a color and you're trying to cover a large area like we're about to in this background, it can be really easy to, um, you know, just be conservative and not make too much of it. Because it, it's always the case, you make a whole bunch of that color and then you end up not needing it. And if you only make a little bit of the, co of the color, you end up needing more, but we know we're gonna need more of it with this layer. So let's go ahead and mix up a nice, big pile of it. So I'm just really saturating my brush with this magenta color. It's not quite as jammy as it was. I should have probably spritzed it earlier and let it sit for a bit. All right, that's pretty good. I've got a lot in that brush and then just mixing it with some water to get it nice and fluid. So you can see it's much thicker than what we used in that first layer. And maybe you like the way it looks super thin and washy, more like watercolor like this. You know, there's no rule that says you have to go thicker, but you can with gouache, so why not? And I don't advise doing what I'm doing right now, which is mixing right on top of my painting. I just dropped a little dot in there. All right, so now I'm going to go in and start putting in this second layer. So it's definitely thicker than that first layer, but it's still pretty fluid so that it moves quickly. And I'm using this flat brush so that I can get up against those mushrooms without having to touch them too much and I'm really controlling my lines so that I can get a nice clean line all the way around and it's no big deal if you accidentally paint onto your mushrooms so don't freak out if that happens and yeah I think I will I made this a little thinner so that I it'll stay wet a bit and I can try to do the thing where I mix the purple in on top of it and get that fun red. And Adrian, while you're doing that, someone is asking, what do you use to clean your brushes? Uh, just 
when you're done or in between, uh, I'll answer for both. So in between, I'm just using water and I'm just rinsing them in my water cup here and then drying them on a paper towel. And then when you're done, just soap and water, just dish soap. You don't need anything fancy for, for water media. I can't tell if that's the mushroom or the background right there. I guess it did come down a little bit. I might have just accidentally painted over my mushroom right there, but I think it'll be fine. All right, so I'm trying to move quickly so that I don't, you know, disrupt this flow of color too much. Like if I had to pause halfway through this and make more of this color, it probably wouldn't be a big deal except for I might not match the color perfectly. So then the next layer might have a little break halfway through and then it might shift to a different color. So if that were to happen, then you would want to just do maybe an entire layer unless you wanted like a two-tone background to happen where it shifts to a different color halfway down. But this flat brush is really helpful because I can kind of curve it in and out at an angle here and fill in all these little nooks and crannies. and then just keep my overall lines pretty, or brush strokes pretty uniform. Sometimes it's hard to decide which path to take when you're doing something like this. And just go whichever direction feels right. And if there's little moments like that, I don't know, I think that's kind of fun when you see the, the hand of the artist like in there a little bit. That's why I don't worry about visible brush strokes, for example. Oh my goodness, I just totally painted in my margin. I'm gonna try to grab that out real quick. That's another reason to keep things nice and washy for layers like this, because I brush over that with some water real quick. I should be able to pull that out, and yep, I did. Another reason I don't advise putting your palette on your paper while you're painting, geez. I'm just trying to make it all close together here. And yeah, this tape isn't foolproof. So if you end up with a little puddle there at the edge of the paper, it doesn't hurt to go ahead and, um, you know, pick up if there's like a puddle happening. It's because you can end up with little leaky moments under your tape if you let too much water sit there. The thicker paint will go on top of the tape, but if it's wet like this, you some of it can sneak under the tape line. We already did our shat our first layer on the shadows last week. So I'm painting around those shadows. And I gotta look at my reference photo. I can't remember if yep, that's a piece of the mushroom right there. And that's not a spot I missed. So yeah, there's a little bit of a moment here where it doesn't quite connect at the same intensity of pink. So those sorts of things could 
If that's bothering you, we can camouflage that by mixing in this purple here. So if you were wanting to go a little different with your colors, like let's say you did yellow, you could maybe do another layer of orange on top of it. That might be kind of nice, or maybe like yellow and brown streaked in could be nice. Or um, blue and green, or maybe I already said orange. You wouldn't want to go with anything that's too close in color to the mushrooms themselves, but something kind of like if you did yellow and brown, the yellow would hopefully peek through the most. And give some contrast to the the mushrooms. All right, I think that's it because that's going to be a pretty heavy shadow in between there. All right, and then now I'm like, did I use purple or did I use blue? I can't remember. Maybe I just used blue and it turned it that. Yeah, I think I added some blue to my magenta. So I'm gonna do that to make that purple. I made it a little darker purple than I meant to. So I'm gonna add some magenta back in there. And I want this to be a lot thicker. But also still a little fluid so it can streak in. And the more I look at it coming in when it's still wet like this, we really do want to wait for this to dry before we do another layer. So I'm going to just go back with the magenta a little bit on top of this and just pull that little bit of purple around. And then I think I might just have to leave it alone because I want to move on. So my background maybe might not be... Well, I don't know. It's going to look different dry versus wet. So maybe this will be thick enough. I had a, actually, I had put this down when I was painting the, the example. I had a good amount of time in between my my second and my third layer. I had done the second layer the first night I worked on it. So the more I think about it, I did put three layers on that background. But I just don't think we have time to do three layers together. But maybe two layers will be nice. It might not be that thick, but it's gonna have some purple in there. It can be a little waterier, but the thicker you go, the more that it's going to be graphic here. So I kind of abandoned the purple a little bit. I'm just like mostly doing pink, but with a little bit of purple still on my brush. Because I think doing a whole layer of the, the violet, red violet might take a little too long. But it's still pretty red violet. But yeah, we want to get the background totally done before we move on to the final layer on the mushrooms, because if we were to paint the mushrooms and then try to do another layer on the background, we could end up um, accidentally painting over our mushrooms. Like if you accidentally paint over the mushroom right now, it's no big deal because we haven't really started painting the mushrooms yet. So we can easily fix any of those moments that may happen because the gouache is so thick. 
it will be easy to cover up any accidental slips of background that get on them now. And yeah, I just say embrace the visible brush stroke because it's hard to get away from it. So letting it just be there. And also gouache looks so different dry versus wet. So those streaks are not going to show up quite the same when this is dry. Also, uh, lighter values will dry and look a little darker and darker values will dry and look a little bit lighter. So it kind of blends itself in this weird way. And I wrote a few little takeaways on a post-it in part one of the class about gouache. And I'll pull that out in just a moment while we're waiting for our background to dry and go over those. But that was one of the, the takeaways was how it looks so much different, wet versus dry. And also thinking about each brush stroke being more like a mark that you're making rather than something you're going over again and again. So I'm paint, I'm doing a little swish of my paintbrush in one area and then I'm jumping over to the next area. So I'm not going back and forth over the same area multiple times. And that is something that I recommend doing when you're painting with gouache or ink. We've got some ink classes coming up in May where I'll talk about that as well. Liquid ink, painting with liquid ink. Um, and then even watercolor, you know, if you keep going over the same area of a watercolor painting, you lose those natural striations that the watercolor has when it interacts with itself and with the watercolor. And, you know, you gotta, just like with people, you gotta let paint be itself, like let the gouache be gouache. You can't force it to be oil paint or acrylic paint or watercolor. It's got to do its own thing. So I love using that analogy because I'm a, when I have parents in a class and I'm sure there's some parents in the class tonight. Um, I have learned as a parent that I can't make my kids be anybody else other than who they are, right? You got to let them be themselves. So you can tell them what you would do in a situation all day long, but they have to make their own choices. So anyway, people get really frustrated with gouache because it's not acting like other paints that they've painted with. And if you have been taking classes with me for a long time, we've done a lot of stuff with pen and ink. Um, so the hatching, cross-hatching, stippling, and scribbling marks that we make when we're drawing with pens, those are very helpful to keep in mind when painting with gouache. So thinking about like when I did that first layer of the background, kind of keeping my lines really uniform, kind of like some horizontal hatching lines. And I'm still doing that as I'm coming in here. Like it may appear that I'm going over the same place over and over again, but I'm really not. I'm kind of doing a little mark and then I'm moving down and then I'm doing another mark and then I'm moving down and I'm doing another mark because that's how the gouache likes to be applied. It responds very well to that. And like I said, it'll dry and do its magical little thing where it blends itself. I mean, not perfectly. You're not going to get rid of all of those brush stroke lines, but looking back at this one, I can see how there were some streaks and maybe some weird moments while it was wet, but I know enough to just back off and leave it alone and let it dry. And then it dried beautifully like that. And all those weird moments that I was worried about went away. Like I remember there was even a super, like a water drop over here 
and I was worried that was going to look weird, but it doesn't. I can see where it was, but it's totally fine. So anyway, just trying to encourage you to not worry about the streaky business that might be happening. I'm not saying it's going to completely disappear. Like you could go back in one more time and try to get rid of some of those. I'll do a little bit of it here. But even as I'm doing that, I'm jumping around. I'm not going back over the same area multiple times. But the problem with it is once you change the tone there, then you want to like keep blending it out to the whole rest of that area. And yeah, if you go back on top with a more watery layer, it might take off something underneath. So I think that's what happened with my last one. And I'm doing it again. And then I'm going to just stop myself. I'm going to stop myself right after I do it again over here. And then I'm going to stop. So what I'm basically saying is do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> I'm like, we're going to leave it alone. And then I keep messing with mine. Okay. I'm going to pause there and set this whole thing aside behind me because we need this to dry. And you could get uh, a blow dryer out. That's always an option. And blow dry it if you were really patient or impatient. But we have plenty we can do while we're waiting for that to dry. Uh, to get our colors mixed up again for the, the mushrooms themselves. So in part one, we mixed up these colors, but it's been a couple weeks, so we've got to make them again. So let me just check the time. We've got plenty of time. Oh, I see Karen was asking, do you not paint the shadows? Um, we will paint the shadows. We're going to do those last since the back, the shadows are technically falling over the background. Uh, that's so we're kind of going in order from back to front and uh, the mushrooms are in front of the background. So we'll do them next. Um, but then also the, the shadow can, even though the shadow is underneath the mushroom. So I realize that's kind of not going in exact order. But we're going to do the shadows last, that last layer on the mushrooms, because we can, if we have any like accidental moments where the mushrooms like go into the background, we can just clean those right up. We'll get that nice clean line of the shadows. So that'll be the last thing that we do. Good question. All right. So get a little smaller paintbrush here to mix up. I'm going to use this little filbert brush here because I like the way it looks for making swatches. And I'm looking for these warmer tones. So, and I went pretty, um, I have to refill my little spritzer bottle here. using the water from my water cup to refill my little spray bottle. Also, I want to know where you buy these spray bottles. I've been doing an at-home mushroom growing kit, by the way, speaking of mushrooms. Um, and uh, it's a local company in Austin called Hi-Fi Myco, uh, like mycology. And um, I just grew some blue oyster mushrooms that are in my fridge now, waiting to be cooked, which I'm very excited about. And last month I grew some pink oyster mushrooms. These king trumpet mushrooms I actually purchased um, at the grocery store, but they're expensive to get the gourmet mushrooms here. But there's a company here in Austin, one of my private lesson students actually told me about it. And she was doing it and I'm like, well, I'm going to get a subscription. I sound like a commercial for them now. But anyway, the kits, when they come to grow them at home yourself, come with these little spray bottles. 
to spritz them with. And they are very handy little spray bottles for gouache painting. I like that full circle moment. My mushroom growing kit gave me a spray bottle that I can use when I'm painting mushrooms with gouache. Okay, so I'm using this ochre color that just comes in my uh, kit here. And if you're having to mix colors from a smaller like primary set, uh, we did have a class a while back on color theory. You can search color theory basics, part one and two. It was with uh, acrylic paint, but color theory works with all different types of mediums. So you apply those same methods of color theory to get these neutral tones if you're struggling to get these neutral tones. But uh, I'm going to use a lot of colors that just come in this set, which is very helpful. So if you happen to just have that color, that would be really helpful. And we can let these colors be a little thicker. So actually, I mean, I could just make a puddle in my little jelly gouache. Um, it here or I can put it in my palette but I just want to get a lot of it since we're going to use a lot of it might as well have enough so that we don't have to mix up more okay and then this other color I'm going to use my little key here. So let me see if I'm calling these the colors that they're labeled as. That's labeled medium yellow in the, the kit here. And then uh, this is earth yellow right next to it. So that is technically the okra, even though I've been calling this my okra. Or this, sorry, this one is the okra. I'm looking at this sideways. This is the earth yellow. This is the okra. I'll get a good little pile of that going in my palette. And this one's coming off in a glob, which is nice. And I'm just adding some water so that I can get them to be nice and fluid. but still thicker than that first thin washi layer that we did. And maybe you mix in a little bit of the that medium yellow with this too. I maybe did that last time the more I look at it. So color mixing is a time consuming and essential part of painting. I don't know of any corners you can cut to avoid it um, other than spending lots of money to buy every possible color variation in a tube that that is available on the market. But even then it's hard with you know supply chain issues and everything to get every single color knowing how to make these colors on your own is always going to be uh, helpful but it is nice when you have a kit like this that, that comes with a lot of the colors that we need but we're still going to have to mix some things together so like I'm gonna make a gray now. So I'm gonna start with my white. You always wanna start with the lighter color first and then slowly introduce the darker color. Otherwise the darker color will just eat the lighter color and it won't change it too much. So I've got my glob of white over here. And I'm just going to slowly touch it with my black. I'm like I might get there sooner in the black pile, but we'll see. We do want kind of a lighter gray. So there's a lot of gray on the side of the mushrooms here. I've 
got a nice light gray and we're gonna want a lot of that. And then we're gonna mix that with our medium yellow to get this grayish medium yellow color to happen. And we want quite a bit of that as well. So we might end up having to make more of this at some point. Let me see if I can get away with adding some brown water to that and not changing it too much. Yeah, that's pretty good. So yeah, we want this variation here. We're gonna use a lot of this color. So I might even wanna make this a little thicker and not so watery. I have a feeling I'm about to turn all of my gray slightly this color. And if it's a little too gray and you want to warm it up, you could add a little more of that okra. Add a little okra to it. That'll warm it up a bit. All right. And then we also pulled in this darker brown. We're going to want a darker brown mixed in with our okra. So this is the one that is labeled burnt umber in my tray here, um, but I want that to be mixed in also with the okra because I want to tone it down a little. And you know, you mix it as you see fit, your colors might not be exact. And honestly, they don't have to be exact. I mean, I put a filter on these mushrooms, you could make them a little more yellowish, like they actually are, you could make them a little more grayish. Uh, as long as you've got a few different neutral tones here and your neutral tones have um, some warmth to them, so some browns and some earthy yellows, you're going to get in the ballpark of what we want for these mushrooms. Okay, so that's pretty good for prepping our palette here. And I always recommend prepping a palette like this before you start on a painting. I was actually teaching color theory uh, this morning in a, one of my in-person classes at the Contemporary Austin at Laguna Gloria, which a mouthful where I teach during the days now. And um, anyway, I was just making a case because I could tell I had some folks in the class who were like, I don't want to do this before I start painting. I want to just start painting. And I'm like, but the reason to do this is I've been teaching adults for 10 years now. And the two things that make people uh, give up and sort of crap out on a painting more than any other things are struggling to render it struggling to render something in their painting um, to, you know, make it look three-dimensional and, and all that and uh, matching the colors. So if you've struggled with that, then you understand how frustrating that can be. And if you don't go in with a game plan, it's, it's even easier to get frustrated. So, you know, if you don't have an understanding of how to mix those colors, and you just start painting and then you have a hard time getting to that color, you might just hit a wall where you're like, oh, I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. This isn't fun. And you put it down and then, you know, maybe a day goes by, maybe a week goes by, maybe three weeks or a month or months. And then it's really hard to get back to it, right? Because you let so much time go by and you still don't know how to mix those colors. So Mixing and matching your colors ahead of time just checks that box. And then you can, um, you know, I like to joke once you do all that front end work, it just paints itself. Okay. Oh, I see Karen said she buys them on those little spritzing bottles on Amazon. Um, 
put diluted paint in them. Oh, that's a good idea. Um, and then somebody's asking, can we see the color palette again? Sure. Um, so there's the color palette for the mushrooms. So, and if you wanted to take notes with a pencil or a pen and write in your sketchbook, like which colors you mix together, I'm always telling people to do that and then not actually doing it myself because, you know, it's one of those things that I just remember now, like looking at that, I don't have to think too much about it. I can tell that this color is these two colors mixed together and that that color has a little bit of that added to a darker brown, but making notes of those things is a good idea. Okay, so this background is not totally dry and this is just one of those things during the Michaels classes, I have to just accept that um, when I spend more time on my class example that I might not be able to get it myself uh, to be exactly like, like this one here. So I am gonna move on to painting uh, the mushrooms and you could add a third layer around the mushrooms when you're done. It'll just be tricky and you'll have to, you know, you'll have to be careful at those edges there. Um, but this is dry-ish. It's still pretty wet in some moments, but some of those streaks disappeared and then a lot of them did not. But um, I would just do another layer on this, but I just don't have the time right now I want us to move on uh so okay let's move on to painting the mushrooms I'm going to be using a lot of my smaller liner brushes for this so like the smaller round brush and this liner brush will probably get me through the rest of the painting here. I'm going to zoom in a little closer and I'm going to take some of my light down. And that cord. This cord usually doesn't. <laughs> oh my God. Cord is having a moment tonight. Okay, that should do it. Okay. All right, I'm really tempted to do another layer on this background, but I'm not going to too risky. But even as I was saying that, I was still thinking about it. Okay, so because if I want y'all to follow along, and if yours is streaky like that, you should definitely do another layer before you paint the final layer on the mushrooms. But maybe you do a little, um, you do another one if you if you're not thrilled with your background, but you decide to go ahead and move on with me now. Or you could just watch right now and decide that you're going to put your final layer on later and hopefully you're not going to put it down for months and months if you wait until later. Okay, so we're going to start with this lighter uh, grayish ochre color. That's the color that I feel like, or the, the one that was gray and medium yellow. I keep calling it okra. We did add a little bit of okra to it, I think. Um, no, it was just the, the gray and the, no, yeah, we did add a little bit of that one. Okay, well, whatever. Anyway, we're going to start with that grayish yellowish color, and we're going to put that in um, underneath on pretty much all of the mushrooms in the uh the lighter areas of the I'm going to call them what my daughter calls them which is the book pages because they look like book pages here so we'll just and we did put a little bit of this color in already but we did it really washy and if it goes in a little too dark darker than you want it 
like that's darker than I want it. Uh, I'll just kind of spread it around a little bit, but it, so it's similar to what we already did last week, but it's thicker. So it's going to show up more. And then I'm going to really just stretch it out with some water. Maybe even grab some of this out and pull it around to some of the other mushrooms. So yeah, these colors, they don't perfectly match what we have in the photograph but I feel like they're close enough and they're they're neutral enough that, that they work and they're gonna build nicely together to create some value on the mushrooms. So I'm kind of pulling from what I put right there and jumping around and putting that everywhere. And I do want it to be wet for the, the next layer of color that we're gonna add. So I'm trying to go pretty quickly because I want to drop in the one that does have more okra in it on top of it. And I want to let them kind of bleed together in a way that creates that fun uh, watercolor effect here. So I'm adding quite a bit of water as I bounce around with, with this color. might even drag it down the side here, even though this is going to end up being gray. Because remember, they're going to dry and look a little bit uh, lighter. So it shouldn't be that stark when it dries. And the more I think about it, I probably did, you know, get in there and tweak these layers quite a bit. I maybe am not going to have the time with our 30 minutes that are left in the class uh, to, you know, get my example looking exactly like the other one, but I'm definitely going to tell you all the ways that I got there and I'm going to demonstrate all of those steps, but some of these steps may need to be repeated. As I recall, when I was working on this, you know, I try not to spend too much time on them, knowing how much time that I'll have to repeat all this in a class, but it just felt like it needed another layer. So I did pull it back out and, and put another layer on the whole thing, but each layer really needs to dry before you go in with another layer. So that's just why we maybe won't have time for me to put as many layers as I did on the other one, but it's going to be the same sort of thing. Okay. So now I want to bring in that warmer color, the one that was, yeah, this one that has that okra color mixed in with the medium yellow and not not the gray so much and hopefully this is still a little wet and you can kind of touch it and let it bleed around on its own because there's some moments where it feels kind of like there's a stain of color on some of these book pages and I'm using little vertical hatching lines that radiate out in that same way that we, we sketched those contour lines. So I'm imitating the path of those book pages as I put it in. And I'm letting it kind of bleed a little bit. And then if it kind of loses, you know, or does a, a weird wonky thing, then I can just grab that out with the paper towel. But I really want it to, to bleed a little bit and imitate the, the way the values are showing up on these book pages. It's not showing up on the Zoom, but y'all can see what I mean in the, the copies of the reference photos that you have. Now there's just some little brown, almost bruisey moments. This is just warmer, it's not really dark brown, right? It's this okra, yellowish situation. And then we'll do a similar thing with the gray in just a moment. And you might want to let this dry 
then do this a couple of times. Like they might not feel full enough or what you know have the volume that you want or the colors that you want after just one layer. But when it gets this wet like this, you have to leave it alone and just let it dry after a while. You can't keep messing with it too much um, once these this layer gets super wet. So And this is another reason why it's nice to start with washes because you can really build on these washes and let the washes like shine through underneath and create all this interesting texture. So there's a few other areas where I might pull that color around, a blot into it. You know, just look at the reference photo and see where there might be some streaky business happening on these mushrooms that look like they need some of that color stretched around. So like down here on these little baby ones, I might put a few of those there. Oh, I forget to draw these in. I can just draw them with my paintbrush. And I'm already making sure to resolve some of those weird edges that I have on the where my mushroom or my shadow or, you know, where it kind of went into the background and I had a little gap. If I see that, I'm trying to go ahead with these layers and fill in those gaps. Okay, now we're ready for this darker brown that had some of the yellow mixed in and some of the okra that is the burnt umber color that we made the one with more burnt umber and that's where we're gonna what we're gonna put on a lot of the caps unless you're working from one of my reference images where the caps have more of a lighter tone, but I'm looking at that one where I put that filter on it and it gets pretty dark brown with that filter. So I'm starting to clean up some of those edges there at the, where it meets the background. And I'm going to jump around with this darker brown and let it kind of bleed where these other colors are still a little wet and just looking for the moments where there are some darker shadows. And letting this bleed a little bit and maybe I want to take some of it out and blot it with my paper towel. If you put it down too strong like I just did, you know, you don't have to be attached to every everything you do with your your paintbrush there if you want to pull it back out with the paper towel that actually gives it a really fun little effect there and makes it feel like the underside of a mushroom cap so you really want things to be a little wet and you're working with the you know the gouache has a lot of properties where you can treat it more like watercolor so we're really uh, pushing the, the watercolor nature of the gouache here I'm also kind of drawing with the tip of my paintbrush. So I'm kind of both drawing with my paintbrush and filling in these areas to let it bleed where it's still wet, bleed with those other colors, cleaning up those edges where it's touching the background. I'm doing a lot of things at once here. with this brown. And if you're trying to make it bleed and it's not bleeding, like right there, that had already dried, then I could 
take a little bit of just water on my paintbrush and make a little puddle to try to make it bleed a little bit. But you might have to do it a couple of times. I'm gonna add a little more and there we go. Oh, and then we had this little moment where it looks like a bite's been taken out of the side of the mushroom. So there are certain colors in every painting that can act as like a bridge between your transitional moments and this dark brown is definitely one of those colors because it's so uh, dark and if you're using it thick or even thin and uh, washy like that it can really help to you know clean up some of these edges but really going direct with any of these colors is going to do that because the gouache is so thick and opaque okay let's see i want another layer that's a little lighter here. Let's go in with our gray. Get the gray going. And then we'll go back and forth with those other colors. So there's quite a bit of gray. And I do want a little bit of this yellow even in my just regular gray, but not quite as as yellowy as that other yellowish gray. So more gray than yellow. And this is where the shadow, like not the actual, sh the cast shadow, but the shadow on the side of the mushroom. This is where this color is our friend. So there's definitely a transitional moment between this gray and that other yellowish gray color. I mean, really all of these colors bleed together a lot the way I'm seeing them on the mushrooms, but I'm gonna bounce around with that gray now and do a similar thing that I was doing with those other colors just now where I'm painting it and then I'm grabbing some water and bleeding it out a little bit, pulling it out with my paper towel. So it, so we're really treating it like watercolor still. But, but not completely, because there are some moments where I'm going pretty direct with it, or just like, you know, right there where it's like half direct and half bleedy. That's something that you can do with some watercolors, but others um, might be tricky. So gouache is like right in the middle of a spectrum where it behaves like behave like watercolor or it can behave like ink. Oh, and that reminds me when I post it, I was going to put up on the screen again. So these were my takeaways I wrote down while we were waiting for that first background layer to dry in part one. It looks different wet versus dry. Let each layer dry. And then those drawing techniques work great with painting with gouache. And those are those value uh, shading techniques that we use with pen and ink. So, and then I did a little hatching, cross-hatching, stippling, and scribbling. So I started with hatching and then made it cross-hatching and then stippling or the one directional or one dot at a time and then scribbling. So using those as if they are brush strokes, using those techniques with your brush strokes. Like right now I'm sort of scribbling in. So scribbling to like move this this color around and make it bleed a little bit. And as I'm putting in, you know, these little lines, like if I wanted to go ahead and put some of the book page, I'm just gonna keep calling them book pages. I'm using patching lines with my brush strokes to do that. So yeah, this would be a good point to go ahead and put in some of those book pages, but just don't get too attached to it being the last layer because you might be do what I did, which is step back from the whole thing and decide, you know, you want to go back in and add 
another layer or two in there. And if you do that, you might cover up this layer. So this is kind of more like the final thing that you would do. The final layer would be to put the the lines, those visible lines that look like the sides of a book page in. So I'm just going to keep doing that while also filling in the caps. And for the caps, I'm just looking at the colors as I see them. Might use all three of those neutral tones that we've been using so far. And you might take some artistic license and just use the colors that feel right while following, you know, the curve of the contours of this form. You don't have to get it exactly like the reference photo because I think some of these textures that we've created and these graphic colors that we're using, the graphic quality of the gouache, it's gonna, we're gonna have a product that we're satisfied with if we're following these steps um, without matching everything perfectly. So yeah, I might be doing like some stippling dots as I'm putting these in. But I, again, just like with that background, I'm not going over the, the same area over and over again. I'm just using one mark at a time, like I would with a paint or with a pen, hatching, cross hatching, stippling and scribbling. And I like to kind of let it sit there for a minute and then drop in some water and let it bleed around because then you've got that moment where it kind of sits there directly. So like in this mushroom cap where it's got the little hole in the middle or like a little funnel in the middle, there's a couple of them where we can see that. I put that color in more direct then I'm letting it bleed a little bit, and then I'm just pulling it out with my paper towel to expose that, that lighter area in the middle or make it feel lighter in the middle. And then I can go in with my white gouache in just a bit and start to add these highlights. And that's gonna finish up those areas nicely or get them to a more finished state. Let's see. So yeah, just really letting these tones bleed together really creates the, the texture that we're looking for. And then if you end up dragging it down too far, I'm just pulling it out with my paper towel. And sometimes even letting it be a little dry and scratchy can add to a texture that you're looking for. I'm going to go in with a darker gray that I happen to still have on my palette from when I was mixing that gray. I didn't put that on the, the color palette itself, but some darker gray would be kind of nice for some of these shadowy areas to start to push our our darker shadows and definitely in this moment right here where this mushroom is falling across that mushroom we could even go ahead yeah let's go ahead and do our our shadows now this would be a good time so you can use black or um oops stuck my finger right in a pile of paint also, I said I was going to use my liner brush and I'm just using the size six round because it's got such a nice point at the end. I can use it for a lot of different lines. Uh, so I'm going to use that gray, but I'm just adding some black to it. So I'm making it just a really dark gray. And if you feel like it's a little too abrupt um, and you want to add like a little bit of this dark brown, this burnt umber to it. In fact, let's do that. We should have put this on our, our swatches. 
Yeah, I'm just making a dark gray and then adding brown to it just to tone it down a little bit. Like that. It's gonna look pretty black even with that dark brown. Like that one, I, I know I did that before, but it's still gonna show up because we're gonna use it so direct here. All right, and you can definitely wait a little while to do this, but I'm gonna go ahead and do it now on mine. Start to put in those shadows everywhere. I'm looking at my reference photo as I do this. I'm just drawing with my paintbrush first. And then filling that in pretty directly. So not much water was added to this. And this is the thing you can't do with watercolor. So what I think is so beautiful about gouache is having this, I'm gonna use a $5 art school word, juxtaposition between the, the direct layers and these thin, loose, bleedy washy layers and you get all these really cool textures to happen but the graphic quality of using it so direct right next to that more watercolor texture just that's what makes it look so it gives it that realism it starts to really feel like you could pluck that mushroom off of the page And we talked about when we were putting the first layer of the shadows in last week, it's totally fine. Sorry, I just bumped my camera. Um, totally fine if your shadows, you know, don't line up in the exact same way. We're just going to get them. Oops, I realized I painted part of my shadow as if it was a mushroom up here. You know, as long as they make sense, the shadows make sense according to the the shape of the mushrooms. I'm just kind of following the shape of the mushroom there. Echoing that shape of the mushroom and a little shadow sliver here. I'm just drawing around the edge of where the shadow is with the point of my my round number six brush and then pressing down on my brush to drag it around and fill in that area with the shadow color and yeah it ends up looking like a pretty absolute black oh having that dimension in it just softens it, having that burnt umber in it just softens it a little bit. And yeah, this was why I, this part was why I included my unedited photo so you can see what the shadow might look like over here. The shadows in the middle of the mushrooms are bigger, so it's a small little shadow over here off of this little baby one, but but it's there. You just have to ignore my shadow taking the photo. There's something about these mushrooms that are just so beautiful that I feel like I have yet to take a photograph of them that really captures how just their storybook quality. I think painting them is almost essential to fully appreciating them and how beautiful they are. I have been taking so many pictures of all the mushrooms I've been growing
All right. Yeah, I really want another layer on this background. I would go in with a lighter pink, I think. And I made it such a dark red violet before. But a lot of those streaks have dried. It's definitely not as streaky, but it's pretty streaky. It definitely could use another layer. And if I did do that other layer, I would just go super thick, mix up a big pile of it super thick and just, you know, do like we did on that first layer, fill it in nice and quick. Okay, how much time do we have left? We have seven minutes. Um, I mean, essentially everything we're gonna, we would do to fully finish these is everything we've already done. So I'm just gonna keep working on, on the, the values. I'm gonna switch to this liner brush and just keep putting in these little detail areas. So like, this is dry, so I can go back in here and try to push. Oh, I know what I haven't done yet is the white highlights. So it definitely, mine could use uh, another layer all the way around doing the same thing we've been doing with these colors to sort of stain these areas and then blend them out. But let me go in with my white highlights and put those, those details in. I'm just going to bleed this one area real quick. like this one area and then also this area because I just saw how I left that one Okay, so there's a few moments that I didn't fill in with anything yet, like right here, that I do need something underneath it before I put the white on top. So, oops, that's, that's the reason why the shadow should be the absolute last thing you do, or at least let that dry before you keep working on the mushrooms. Because I just bled one of my shadows out a little bit there. It's not too bad. Okay, let's go in with this white. And this is where you can continue to push these little book page lines, you know, the lighter values that are showing up there. And this is really the part where I probably put these in and then was like, no, I need to put more of the shadows in. So you might end up having a back and forth between putting the highlights in and then going back and doing the shadows some more and then vice versa. But really I'm just looking at my reference photo and seeing where there's like some little highlights like in these chunky moments where it looks like a bite's been taken out of the mushroom in some spots or a piece broke off. And then definitely like inside of this little, what feels like a vortex, remember, getting that to be a little lighter in the center there so that it feels like it's dipping and curving. And then you can add a little water and blend out your white. But since the white is so opaque, it might overtake some spots. So that's why you might want to go back in with uh, the shadows. And then down here on the little baby ones sticking up, I definitely haven't put all of my, you know, dark brown where I need to put it still down there. But there's, once you get that there, you could go back in with these white highlights. So pretty much just wherever we're seeing a little moment 
of white or where we want to put the highlights in on the book pages. If anybody knows what those are called, um, <laughs> feel free to share. I'm just going to keep calling them book pages. All right. I think that's pretty good place to end. So, and then I'm just going to do like a cooking show and switch back to my fully completed example here. And even though we didn't get completely to this level, um, it's just the same thing over and over again in all of these, these areas to, to further develop those details. And we have just a couple minutes left and uh, Andrea is saying we always called them gills. Okay, yeah, they do kind of look like gills. Uh, but if you wanna hold up your, your painting, as long as nothing's too wet or taped to the table, Oh, I see Dorothy did an orange background. I'm excited to see some of y'all's examples. Um, here, I'll just go ahead and spotlight Dorothy. Oh, that's nice. Oh, wait, that's Barbara. Sorry, I clicked on the wrong one. They bounced around. <laughs> well, there's Barbara's example. Lovely pink background like I did. And the textures are coming along really nice so far, Barbara. Um, and then here's Dorothy. Oh, wow, Dorothy. Yeah, you got the texture on the the gills or the book pages to come across really nicely. And that background looks nice and, and even. All right, and this is Brooke. Hold it up a little higher, Brooke. Yes, that's lovely. Oh, and you already took the tape off. That looks really nice. Like those clean edges. Yeah, you really got them to float there. I feel like I could just pluck them right off the page. Right, and this is Andrea. Oh, that is so lovely with the blue background. See, those streaks don't bother me, especially when you got them to be kind of following a vignette of lighter blue. That's a great idea. I might go back in and add a layer like that to mine. And I like how you have your little palette off to the side there, just treating the whole thing like a study. Love it. Okay, I don't see anybody else holding up their example. We're just tapping through everyone real quick. Um, thank you for sharing. Those of you who did share, and if you didn't get a chance to share yours, but you'd like to share later, you can, um, you know, share them on Instagram or Facebook and use those hashtags. Make it with Michael's or Michael's classes, um, or Felicia added yeah share on our social media platforms using michael's hashtag michael's classes make it with michael's and learn with michael's i should add that that third hashtag and you can follow michael's on uh learn with at learn with michael's on instagram as well they post about all the weekly classes that that are coming up all right uh thank you all so much i really enjoyed our class and have a great evening